Welcome everyone. Carter School Research Committee, sponsored by the Dean's Office, Methods Mondays. Um, so uh, purpose of these is for uh, professors in peace and conflict resolution land to talk about various um, research methodologies. Um, this is designed to supplement the coursework um, that our graduate students are taking um, based off of a survey that Mike Swigert here and I sent out um, in the spring. So today we have the incomparable Dr. Daniel Rothbart, um, who is going to be speaking on after gathering data, what's next? Transitioning from research data to the completion of a project. Um, and this is the description that Dr. Rothbart has. Anyone engaged in rigorous qualitative research eventually faces a range of tricky methodological questions that arise after all the data are gathered. How should the data be organized? How should data be evaluated regarding its relevance to the project subject matter? Should the data irrelevant to the project's objectives be removed or probed more deeply? What should be done with contradictory data? Which method of analysis should be selected? How exactly should the analysis be carried out? The answer to these questions are neither self-evident nor simple. They call for judgment, skill, and patience. Don't give up and don't take your frustrations out on your dog or cat. That is my favorite line from this description. <laughs> um, this workshop focuses on the practical tasks that arise after data are gathered. Uh, Dr. Rothbard will offer tips, suggestions, recommendations, and do's and don'ts to navigate these tricky tasks. Um, uh, after Dr. Rothbard's presentation, we'll also have an um, open conversation where students can air challenges with their current research projects. Uh, Dr. Rothbard, over to you. Thank you so much, Nick and Susan Allen, for organizing this. This is so important, this series. Um, and uh, it, it, at least because um, people here know how um, th these kind of questions and topics in this series are kind of like what makes us become professionals. This is what we do. This is what kind of why we, to put it simply, why we matter and people should realize that we matter um, because of our expertise. This, this series makes you an expert. And um, I'm only talking about one phase of analysis, but uh, um, collectively, I think the series basically delves into the, the you know, the really, uh, the micro process and the micro challenges here. Um, so thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, and I'm going to share screen. So please ask, you know, questions, comments, anything along the way, um, and it's wonderful to see you here. So share screen. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a phase of analysis that is particularly tricky and um, it's something that I've seen so many students struggling with, and that is the, the, the transition from after you gather the data, what do you do? And you know, I know it's an obvious question in the grand scheme of things, but I've noticed that a lot of people struggle with this. And this is after you know uh, taking all the classes and so on. So I'm gonna mention some of the kind of do's and don'ts, as it were, and some of the challenges. Um, and let me preface by saying, none of the things that I'm going to talk about, and this is just qualitative entirely, I'm not talking about quantitative, none of the things that I'm talking about are really analytically difficult. Um, it's not like uh, learning a deep dive into the theories of conflict. It's a matter of just making lots of little decisions. So again, after the data, what's next? 10 steps for research success, or maybe fame, glory, riches, and power. It's possible, but we'll see. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of these steps. And again, feel free to add comments, remarks, questions as 
we go along, I'll um, just raise your hand. Um, so I'm going to uh, go through this with a, an example of a research project that um, I, I finished uh, two years ago and it was published last year. And this was a project um, that in which, and just very briefly about the objectives here, this is a project within a series of research about compassion and peace building. Um, one article, by the way, um, I wrote with Susan Allen, that was a kind of a broad brush uh, perspective on peace building as a, a field of compassion practices. And this article is a case study of compassion of students at a peace building kind of um, uh, a, a peace center in a small village in Northern Italy called Rondone, where um, I interviewed 23 students. These are master students who are learning the field of peace building and they come from conflict zones, which is important. So it's, it's, it's a total immersion. So the first thing to do in, in research, so again, I'm, I'm kind of jumping in here, assuming you've gathered data. You've gathered quantitative data, and that could be obviously from interviews, from uh, focus groups. Um, it could be reading uh, testimony from, from some source that's available. Um, first thing, and I know I'm going to mention some things that sound so obvious, but it's just a matter of emphasis. Just retain everything. Um, in particular, retain the contact information even of your research participants. Sometimes you might need to go back and ask for uh, some special information about them. That may be difficult, obviously, because oftentimes after we interview people, um, they're kind of scattered. Um, retain basically the source of the testimony, obviously. Retain the informed the inform consent forms. Um, it's very likely that after you go through the uh, institutional review board, you are required to get informed consent. And there's different methods for that, one of which is um, literally they'll sign something. I had, I actually used this thing called paper um, when I was interviewing them. And we had pieces of paper because I felt that was super easy during the interview, as opposed to some online signature thing, which sometimes gets kind of clunky. Um, so they literally just sign their name to the um, informed consent. And, oh, I want to show the informed consent. So let me uh, just very quickly do that. So here's the informed consent that we used, and it explained, you know, what we're doing and the, and the risk, which were basically none, um, and confidentiality and all that, and then just had a signature there. And obviously, you need to keep that. The tricky thing, the tricky thing with paper is paper can get lost. And uh, so um, there. Um, so obviously, you know, especially if you're overseas, so obviously you need to be careful. Also, it's very obviously important to retain the interview question. So that's step one. Okay. Um, step two, organize the data. Um, a lot of times the, um, well, obviously you'll, you'll need to do some kind of transcription and there's so many online processes now uh, Nick, I remember a couple of years ago when you came and we were talking about how to do transcription, like the first year when we were with Professor Gope, I think we were chatting with Professor Gopin, um, but it actually in that short period, there's so many online resources now that have been um, that made available. So the let me just show you the difference between a kind of before and after. So here's a before of a transcription. It is really ugly. It is like, you know, oh my God, this looks so annoying. Um, and um, 
Malatai was that was because I was downloading it and I forgot to put a title on it and it was the restaurant that's near the office you know it was kind of one of these automatic location finders okay so this is like really ugly but this is the transcription and obviously I'll have to go through this because a lot of times transcription is terrible and the reason I say it's ugly is who wants to read this like I don't I don't want to have to examine you know, whatever, dozens or hundreds of pages like this. So there is a process where you literally have to make it neat. Oh, that is so, oh, that's a feel good to me. That transition is like, uh, oh, that is such a relief. I can read this. Um, I have to remember what the questions were, obviously, juxtapose that. I didn't insert those in this particular transcription, but this is so easy to read. And these are actual transcription. So it is so important to make it easy to read because of the next step that I'm going to tell you um, you know, make it easy for yourself, visually easy, because you have you're going to be living with this this process. Any question, comments so far? Okay. Um, uh, okay. So reader friendly document. So that's step two. Um, step three: secure the data in a safe place. Um, actually, two sites. So obviously security is critical. Um, this, is, this is where a paper copy is risky. I would not have, if you're overseas especially, I would not rely only on a paper copy, you know, uh, for obvious reasons, but secure it in, the, in two sites in the clouds. MS Teams is, is great. Um, you could just put everything in folders in MS Team and make sure you clearly organize the folders, like maybe day one, day two, or so on, or the names of the um, interviewees. It's very easy. This is so much a matter of organizing large data. Um, in vivo is also good. Some people use in vivo. Um, I, have it, I don't use it generally, but some people find value in in vivo and um but i think ms teams is is uh is terrific so that's that's an obvious need um step three this is where you absolutely have to live with the data so going back here to this reader friendly version i mean reading this will immediately, you know, you you immediately have very clear impressions. And what I mean by impressions are just um, just images. The, the, the best uh, testimony is the one that provides detail imagery. What I mean imagery is like you can visualize what they're talking about. You know, the people came here, they did this to me, then we suffered or we had this response or then we did that and then people felt whatever they felt. Um, and um, this then will obviously stand out, you know, the more, uh, I think, vivid um, and in contrast to analytical, to analysis tends to be abstract. Obviously, that's valuable, too. I didn't mean to suggest that's not valuable because it's part of the testimony. Um, uh, but a, a lot of times the analysis um, sometimes is is it's not idiosyncratic that often experiences of people tend to be, you know, uh, very specific, obviously um, heartfelt in many cases and obviously worthy of serious attention so it is quite appropriate um this this file is 68 pages 
Now, obviously, that's a hell of a lot. But if you if you put in, you know, break it up into a couple hours. I mean, you can do, you know, do a scan, 30 pages one time, then go out and, you know, do bungee jumping or, you know, whatever, um, you know, whatever sumo wrestling. Um, no, no one here can do that. But uh, and then come back um, with, you know, sufficient legal substances of caffeine and then do it again. And, you know, another 30. So it's it's not that bad on the first read. And I'm telling you, this is where imagery, where ideas come in and obviously the beginning of the coding process. Um, which I'm going to mention right now, take notes, it, it track changes, or, um, you know, I like, uh, I did print this out when I was home and I had paper, you know, um, and uh, um, sometimes I started with just penciling comments on that but track changes is super easy obviously um and just start just what they say and in the initial comments it's not your opinion hold on your opinion till later you're not making a judgment and try okay so so this is the reading the reading phase is just read 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 and reread and um I know that that sounds again obvious, but when you when you read sixty eight pages, you know, single spaced, you, you eventually you're going to get imagery later that thought, oh, maybe I missed that on the first read earlier. So there might be some ideas or experience that jump out later on in the sixty eight pages, which then might trigger you to think that maybe this appeared earlier, um, uh, which is significant. So that's why the two or even three reads are helpful um, to give you this these ideas and, and track change notes. Um, step five, I do uh, thematic analysis, narrative analysis, sometimes grounded theory, and all of those involve some kind of coding. So um, I think you know, coding is just a label that you attach to a portion of the data. And this is a question, obviously, what label do you attach? And the point of coding is not for you to give your judgment. You know, if they're talking about uh, starvation, it's not a good idea to say basic human needs deprivation. You know, so there's a difference between their experience of, let's say, hunger and your theoretical knowledge of basic human needs. That's an abstraction. Coding, which was, it may not be said, unless, of course, the speaker does say, you know, deprivation of needs. Um, um, not likely to use theoretical concepts uh, unless they are, of course, conflict, you know, major conflict students um, or, or experts, obviously. So uh, try to provide, as it were, neutral description of data. Now, I know a, a, more than a little about controversies about neutrality. Um, there's no such thing as absolute neutrality in anything that we do. Everything we do is layered with normative implications, sometimes explicitly. And here I'm saying, don't do it explicitly. Um, that is tacitly, try to suspend your normative judgment in the coding. It's just a label of a piece of data. Um, then step six. Okay, so coding, just to stay on this for a very short time, I see coding as a series of balancing acts. It's kind of like high wire analytics or high wire uh, discursive. It's a balance um, between 
uh, attention to what you expect, attention to what you expect um, versus new thing. So after you start coding, you know, like if you go into 30, 40 pages, you're going to start expecting the same thing. And that happens, but also be open to new topics. It is unpredictable, you know, to some degree there's repetition, but it frequently happens that someone says something that's, whoa, that is stunning, you know, in the testimony had not been said by previous uh, uh, participants, at least previous in the sequence. Secondly, balance your terms with their terms in the coding, which means that it's okay for you to use different terms than what the participant used, um, being very careful, again, not to impose, um, you know, this gets to the neutrality question. There is no neutrality here, but try to be as close to what they say as possible. Um, let me just add parenthetically, the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges we have in conflict analysis is distance. We are so removed from experience, from life, from their uh, their way of being, their, their um, immersion in conflict settings. And our job is to try to undermine that distance. So do the best you can with selecting terms that you think does capture what they um, have said. Obviously, you can also select their terms in a phrase that's next to it, which you think maybe a phrase captures a piece of um, uh, a single uh, strip of data. The um, coding needs to be both efficient, but also comprehensive, efficient in the sense you don't need to code everything. And that is actually a real tricky point with the fourth point here. Um, invariably, if someone uh, is very um, verbose, um, if someone extensive in their, in their delivery, uh, very talkative, there'll be irrelevancies. It's really tricky to determine what is irrelevant and what is not. Be pretty generous with coding more than less because sometimes things that seem irrelevant are actually quite relevant. Um, any question, comment about this? Okay. Um, all right. So uh, step seven, progress, going back and forth. So after you attempted the coding, it's it's quite useful to go back to your initial coding selection. It's totally fine um, to change your initial coding in light of what you have gathered later in the in the um, uh, process. So uh, along the way, obviously you're going to notice, certain similarities. You're going to obviously notice differences. These will be, as it were, emergent that come up. Um, but going back and forth is totally fine. And that's the advantage, of course, with track changes, um, where you know you can easily, easily revise. And it sometimes happens where you use the same code, obviously, later in the process. Um, step eight, okay, so if you're doing thematic analysis um, or, or possibly narrative analysis, which, which is somewhat similar with respect to the narratives that come out, um, this is now a, an abstraction from the codes. So usually a, a theme basically is a pattern response to a certain amount of data. There's no rule for uh, for um, actually, sorry, let me put it a different way. Um, some people say that this is an inductive process. Um, 
I mean, that's in a very loose sense of the word inductive because it's basically a summation of a large body of data. You do not have, it's not appropriate to have one theme for just two units of data, for, for just two or three. Um, that is, after you, um, let's say I have 68 pages here, I could imagine three major themes from 68 pages. It's possible to have sub-themes as well. So within the major theme, you can have sub-themes. So um, in this case, let's say um, hatred of the enemy well, it could be a major theme uh, in this example. You could have sub-themes, hatred of the enemy, hatred of their compatriots, hatred of the leader. Obviously, you can need to, that, that is an option there. Um, sometimes we use visual representations like a diagram. And always, it is very important to be aware of context here. That is, what is the social political environment in which the uh, researcher is talking about. Your knowledge is very, very important here. Um, yet we all know that many times the research participants are themselves experts. And uh, we, I know you've heard this before, but basically many times they have experiences that are are not in any textbook and are something that need to be um, recognized. So context here, especially their history, is very helpful to understand and to know. Um, what else? Step, uh, step nine, if we're doing thematic analysis, okay, so you, so the theme again is a narrative summation of a certain body of data and put the theme as a full set. I prefer a theme as a full sentence as opposed to a couple of terms. Review the themes by refining the initial labeling, breaking down the themes maybe to um, sub-themes. Um, there's two kinds of themes that are possible. One is the theme that's inductive, as I mentioned before. Some people use what's called theoretical thematic analysis. And those themes come from the theory, uh, the theory of change that you're invoking. They come from the theory or theories that underpin the rationale for your project. So that means that the terminology let's say structural violence, uh, the terminology of structural violence could be incorporated in the theme. And yet, even with theoretical thematic analysis, obviously it, it must capture the, the narrative summation. This is probably the hardest part, I think, of the whole process that, um, that we're talking about today. The articulation of a theme, I think is the most tricky because, and this is really, really important, there are no preset rules or algorithms for defining exactly what the theme should be with a given set of data. That um, nebulous characteristic makes it both obviously flexible, but layers of uncertainty as to what is the right theme. Um, and that's endemic to both thematic analysis, it's endemic to narrative and also grounded theory. Uh, and this is something, again, it is a kind of uh, Feel. It's a kind of practice. It comes with practice and obviously reading other works. Obviously, it's very helpful to read professional articles to, show, to examine the relationship between the data and the theme that is articulated in the article. Um, additionally, when you have a, a theme that's presented, 
give the theme a name um, that reflects what you represent, that what they represent, and write up an analysis of the theme. So for example, uh, the if, if we had a theme that the researcher, excuse me, the research participant, let's say that I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Let's say the research participant was talking about their traumatic experience of seeing loved ones die. They can't sleep at night. They have dreams, they have fears, and so on. Psychological um, characteristics of suffering, and so on. And imagine your theme was that the these participants experience PTSD. Now, the, the challenge is that the participant may have not said PTSD. That's your analysis, which obviously could be sound, but it's based on a theory of how you define it, how you identify it, and so on. Um, so if you use a very technical, in this case, medical, or psychological analysis term, you need to explain what is PTSD, how, how are you defining it, which turns out to be quite a controversial issue and topic, and um, in particular, how are you applying the knowledge that psychologists and so on have gathered, how are you applying that to this particular testimony? So the analysis is really um, important in your development of this. And just going back here very briefly um, to uh, describe, explain, and um, define the theme. And that is pretty much, oh, I'm almost done with 10 steps. By the time you do this, you might be a little tired of looking at 60, 100, 200 pages of single space thing. You might be tired. You might be a little, dare I say, I mean, we all love having a passion, but sometimes, you know, you know, the passion's gone, the thrill is gone. And so at that point, um, just go on vacation. I mean, just get away from it. Take a break do whatever, I don't know, just do something legal. And I, and I know that sounds, I know that sounds rather mundane. I can't tell you how many times it's been a lot where I get immersed in something, I'm really tired of it. And sometimes I'm just stuck. It just, it's not feeling, dare I say natural. And I go away and travel and do something and come back and say, oh, that's obvious. And I, I know what I'm saying sounds simple, but for me personally, it is so effective, especially to get away physically, get out of this room. I've been here so long uh, in this room to do something physically uh, distant from what you're doing, and then come back and be refreshed to have new, a kind of new vision of what, what you'll do. And I, I, it's very, very likely that will be um, helpful. So those are the 10 steps that we're just going through. Um, as I say, none of this, I think just the formulation of the theme is probably the most analytically tricky because basically you have this mass of discursive data in front of you and how do you capture that in a sentence so that's tricky and as i say the fact that there are no there's no algorithm for that there's no mathematical formula it is um, a trial and error process and I think that that trial and error process is probably appropriate. You will probably change 
it's very likely the theme, you know, and refine it and so on. And that's where the, the obviously the selection of the terms in the theme is very, very important. Whereas the coding, I mean, it's so loose, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's some, some of it is obvious and you have um, various options there. It can be really, really rough, rough on the coding. The theme is your knowledge that you are contributing to the world. The data, you're not contributing the data to the world directly. The data justifies your theme. Your contribution to the world is the theme. And of course, people do want to see the methodology also. So I'm going to stop here and um, entertain any question, comment, or disagreement, as I say, tend to say in class. So great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rothbart. Um, okay, so I'm going to kick off the QA portion. Um, what I'm what I would like to know is you've got your transcripts. You're starting to um, starting to think through the coding process. How big picture question? How do you choose? Oh, I want to do a thematic analysis or grounded theory or whatever. A little bit more details, and I'm asking this for a personal reason. I'm at the phase in dissertation where I've got pretty much all my interviews done. I think maybe one or two more um, uh, transcriptions are coming along and. Uh, Dr. Rossellina, so for those of y'all who don't know, she's my dissertation chair. Um, we've been having, as we've been working on my proposal, um, I want to go more grounded theory. I know it is a lot of effort and takes a lot of time. Um, uh, thematic analysis for me has always felt fairly intuitive. And since I've been doing qualitative work, it's been mostly um, in thematic analysis. But thematic analysis, Dr. Crossley and I are talking a little bit about um, uh, when one is more appropriate and when the other is more appropriate. Um, Dr. Rothbart, at what stage do you say, uh, I'm doing thematic analysis or whatever else? And what is your internal process that says, this is the analytic um, mechanism, uh, framework, uh, instrument, this is what I'm going to choose and why? Well, the, the, the stage is as early as you can. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, th I think that's, you know, just very practical as early as you can. And there's some methods that are suitable for certain topics. I mean, it's obvious with quantitative versus qualitative. Um, and, you know, with respect to the choices that you just mentioned, you know, it's kind of like toss ups and so on. Uh, thematic analysis gives enormous um, flexibility. Grounded theory tends to be a little bit more, you know, there's the three stages that there's kind of like an added stage to grounded theory. I, I don't know where, why they call it a theory. It's not a theory, it's a technique. So that's a misterm, mislabeling, but that's not what it's called. Um, just as early as you can. Um, so I think, you know, in theory, a lot of these are similar. Narrative analysis tends, tends to be good with topics, um, case studies oftentimes will do narrative analysis where you analyze topics. Discursive analysis obviously is analyzing uh, conversation, tend to be conversational. Um, so um, I think the best answer is to delve more deeply into the theories on this. I mean, if we're really doing it you know, properly, and your question is so important at the early stage is to start delving into the different theories of, you know, the pros and cons of each. And um, yeah, so that's a short answer. I see Mike has his hand up. Yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. It was really nice. Um, I have actually a, a related question, I think that fo follows up nicely on, on Nick's, but uh, and my my question is more about the stage in the in the process where you you select your method. And part of the where I'm coming from with this is, as you know, I've I've gone hard into the quantitative methods, and there's increasing um, there's an increasing norm or expectation 
uh, within quantitative research, particularly in psychology and political science and some others that you pre-register your analyses. So you pre-register your entire research design, including your hypotheses, but also you talk, you say the particular method you're going to apply in the pre-registration. And obviously with, you know, qualitative, you usually don't have the hypotheses and that's the most important part about the, typically you don't have the hypotheses, but, and that's the most important part of the pre-registration for the, the quantitative work. Um, but there's also, there, there are more people who actually even pre-registering qualitative research from what I've heard. Okay. Um, and so I'm curious, I'm curious if you've heard anything about that and I, you know, I, how, yeah, I'm I don't have a, I don't have a substantial answer. Um, so I have not, um, but what what do you what do you know about the qualitative pre-registering someone at one someone this summer at this program uh this workshop i was doing they were put they were play it was in psychology and they were putting a lot of press like emphasis on pre-registration and uh open open science basically and someone sent around a, a, a template for qualitative research how you could pre-register it I don't know a lot about it, but I just wonder how you would think about going something through something like that, you know, like if you say, I mean, basically, I guess you would need to say, I'm going to analyze the data this way, like at least a paragraph or something describing how you would do it. Um, but I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that, because it, even even for quantitative, it's difficult sometimes to where you feel like you're restricting. I feel like I'm restricting myself. <laughs> and okay. So, so pre-registration to whom? Um, usually it's on, it's there, like there's um, OSF, the Open Science Framework, there are oh. different sources online where you just, you basically put it, you basically are putting the information in your research design online for people to be able to see. Okay. So the idea is that you're being more transparent about your research and that you're not, um, it, it's, it's meant to try to counter some problems that you have mostly in quantitative with like p-hacking or people, you know, basically just running analyses and seeing what fits. Okay. So I, I don't have a good answer for you, I'm sorry to say, but, uh, um, the, uh, you know, obviously it, it's appropriate to, you know, write up your methodology ahead of time. You know, obviously you have to do that for IRB because IRB, it, you, probably everybody here knows how is very demanding, especially about the relationship with research participants and confidentiality and privacy and so on. But um, I... I have not done the pre-registration um, and nobody bothered me about it. So I don't have a good answer. Sure, so, I, uh, I wasn't, I don't think it's that particular with qualitative, I don't think it's a widespread practice yet, but I think it, there's some people who might be doing it. So I was just curious what were your thoughts okay. on, on it. So okay. thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. um, good to Good to know, I'll look out for that. Mm -hmm. um, and if I find out anything, I'll let you know. Uh, Shelley. Thank you, Dan, so much for that presentation. Um, I would like to ask a, a personal technical question okay. to see how you handle this issue that I have a problem with. I'm writing ethnography and my process is not linear whatsoever. I am conducting interviews while I'm writing and I'm writing while I'm conducting interviews and I see myself as a very organized person, except this feels so unbelievably disorganized and it's stressful. So I would love to see how you, when you have your interviews looking the way you like them, and then you go to interpret interpretation stage and writing, how do you keep track of what you what parts of interviews you've already used and written about? Because I'm like, oh my God, this person said this six months ago. Did I did, do I have to scroll back through you know 150 pages to find it? And I, I can't remember what I've used and what I haven't. And I'm like tried color coding things and it just feels like a giant mess. So I'd love to know what you do. Okay. Uh that's really a great question. So you're asking. What, um, how do you keep track of what you actually already have not only read, but took notes on? Okay. Yeah, um, and like what you've already used, what you've already written about. So, sometimes I'm like, oh my so, God, did I so talk about that about, yet? I can't remember. 
Yeah. So written about, of course, the 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 first step is just notate, you know, just jotting down and then just keeping track that, oh, I finished interview number 10, you know, and so on, you know, just keep track. I actually numbered, you know, gave numbers to the number of interviews. So it was easy to keep track. I, I had, as I say, only 23, you know, so that's pretty small. But even if you had 60, you know, just literally numbering. And I really find track changes to be terrific to keep track. And then, you know, I could have this document I showed you is 68 pages. It could be hundreds and hundreds of pages. And you see very clearly in track changes what where I took notes. And then I do something really technical after interview number, whatever, I say, I write in stop. Okay, this this is how technical, you know, I mean, this is like, so some of this stuff is just, um, I literally put in my very large file, the term stop. And then, uh, then if I go bungee jumping, no, I've never done bungee but, but, you know, then come back, then I just look for that. So I find, you know, whereas the old way of having paper with pencil marks, that's where the problem you would raise comes up for the reason that you just said. So the, the actually what a corollary or just kind of a related to your question is you need to keep track of how many times you read something. And I would, I really think, you know, again, sometimes just initial impressions, track changes or whatever. And I think reading it all three times is, is appropriate. You know, again, you know, how many, how much do you have? It's a, it's a question of efficiency and how much time you have, obviously. So this document is 38,000. The one I showed you with the neat version is 38,000 words. And uh, that's a lot. That's like half a book. 38,000. Is that right? Yeah. So 38,000 words is half of a small book. And um, I mean, you know, yeah. So um, some method that you use, and as I say, I find track changes to be really helpful. Or just codes that you use. So, but ethnography has its own methodology, obviously, which is different. And I didn't really talk about that today, um, but it's so fortunate that we have anthropologists in our department, in our school, excuse me, and uh, they are experts at this type of thing. So, um, so, okay. So I don't know how much your energy level is, but uh, I don't know if you want to go through one, but um, I think, I think, you know, I have a little text here. Let's from, do it. Let's do it. Okay. So just very, very quickly here. So this is from another study. We, um, Okay, this was also a compassion study in a certain sense. We did a study some years ago, actually with a with a, a, a student. Um, Tutsis, excuse me, um, in Rwanda, uh, there were, this is a very little known part of the genocide. There were rescuers, Hutu civilians, who we talked about this in the class, Mike and Nick. Um, there were Hutu civilians who, of course, at the during the genocide, the, the Hutus were required to identify Tutsis and participate in some way in the horror. And some of them refused to do that and actually rescued many Tutsis. And our study was to ask the question, which I still think is an amazing um, part of every mass atrocity. Why do some people 
risk their lives to help other people. And um, so this was just a testimony that we gathered. We had 33 interviews uh, that we gathered and this was public testimony. So, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, no, the testimony was not public. We gathered the testimony. My colleague on this project gathered the testimony. So here I have data, it's pretty simple, and then just do some coding. And if you wanna just read this very quickly, you can try to try your hand. How would you code this? You're asking how would you code this? Yep. So um, three big buckets that I use. Um, this came from a journal article. I'd have to find it. It's uh, It was a really cool piece on uh, basically how to translate qualitative research into policy or policy prescriptions or something. Um, so uh, I look at what of this can be lumped into context so we know rwanda all right we've got ethnic groups um people who are hiding people then you move into actors so you've got i see two three groups of actors um the the terrorists or the genociders whatever you want to call them the people doing the hiding and the people being hid and then the third bucket or group is process so um, uh, uh, trying to enact violence against another, um, uh, putting, uh, uh, burying or digging holes and putting people in the holes, um, right. uh, exactly. hiding and saying secret, whatever. So context, actors and processes, um, those are three ways that I get into the, like, the zone of what to look at, how to go about um, coding, whether or not those buckets actually make it into the analysis you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it does. So you have in your mind, like a set of, I, I would call them kind of analytical tools. Yeah. Like preset, which we all have, you know, there's no such thing as coming in totally without preconceived pre notions. And then the process, this is very process narrative. Yeah. You know, as you're saying. So, you know, good. Um, anything else? There's, there's more, there's more to it than process. What? So, so the process here, let's see, this is process. You know, we hid like the first attack. It seemed to be the first because here he has a second. So we hid people in a hole. And then here's the second attack. The killers were searching for Tutsi, something like that. So that's process. But note, notice here, this is self-reflection. And here, this is trauma, because he uses the word. So I tend to be really cautious and resistant to technical terms here unless they use it but he used trauma so that's not quite process that's his self diagnosis in a way or or something like that what one of the things i like to do when i'm looking at qualitative data like this is i try to dig i try to find for example what is the main point like what is their point that they're trying to communicate? Mm -hmm. I try to separate that a little bit from basically the evidence they're using to justify or their point. Yeah, argue something, and then also for, even then separately potentially their explanation of that, and like also how they evaluate things. So I try to separate all those things because sometimes it's like there's usually a, there's usually a point in there that they're trying exactly. to make. exactly, and then you, and then you yeah. separate. The, Contact, like the justification and explanation of that. That's absolutely, there's usually a point. It's very rare someone will just go through factually, this happened, that happened, that happened, that happened, and that happened. They might say that, but everybody, I mean, this is the point of life is how we, you know, how we experience it and feel it. 
especially when it's emotional, which so much of what we analyze is about emotionally intense experiences. Um, of course, we tend not to talk about our own, heaven forbid, because we're so objective. Um, okay, what else? Um, could I ask other folks what if you have any experience with this? And I see other students here. If you have any experience and any challenges with uh, qualitative research that you want to bring up, anything with qualitative research, OK? Well, I, I don't have anything on this um, particular note. I actually had a question that I wasn't sure if we were still entertaining those, but um, sure. I'm, and you might have mentioned this and, and I was multitasking, missed it, but to what extent do you gauge in your own reflective practice when you're doing the coding process? Uh -huh. um, and how does that kind of change your approach as you interact with the data? I love this question. Um... Let me tell you the theory and then the reality check. So the theory is you don't need to do it. The reality check is you do. And what I mean by theory is the textbook. It's very rare with, well, there, there's some analysis of, of, of thematic where they'll, do, they'll say, um, identify your assumptions. But it is very important to identify your assumptions and especially your weaknesses. Now, we never rarely like to broadcast our weaknesses. And I wish students would say that to me. And I wish professors would say that to other professors. Here's one. I don't really know a lot about this conflict. Confession of ignorance is absolutely the a critical aspect for success, is one important aspect because once we articulate that, you don't have to play games with yourself of hiding or avoiding reading more, or, you know, in some cases, not taking seriously what the participants said. So lack of knowledge should be, um, people, we, sh we should become aware of our lack of knowledge, our ideological bias that everyone in our field is ideologically biased. I don't mean that is necessarily a cor corrupt thing. Bias means preconceived notion. And that means if we are biased, if we have preconceived notions that systemic uh, violence, structural violence is all over the place, we're gonna miss some of the like psychologistic aspect, because structural violence tends to be pretty weak on the, the, as it were, human experience. It's not a contradiction, it's just not emphasized. Whereas if you come as an expert with extensive knowledge on PTSD, maybe you should be aware, you know, do you really know about the evidence for structural violence? So we all have that, um, anyway. Thank you for that question. And some methods like participatory action research basically require reflection on one's positionality, and positionality is always about power that we have and don't have. Okay, any other question, comment? Hey, Susan. Hi there. I want to, I want to, um, Chime in on the, uh, I like Nick's comment in the chat, go par. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also, I'm looking at the time and realizing we're getting towards the end here. And I want to thank you for the emphasis on reflection as a part of this process. And I appreciate that you've put out 10 stages, but you've also put out the space for the reflection and the potential iterative processes and the, the, um, the messiness that comes with research too. So thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. And Dr. Rothbard, are you good to share slides? Of course. You send those to me. Um, awesome. We can send them out to uh, 
folks who showed up and then um we're going to be posting all of these recordings it's going to be on carter school website right dr allen yeah um maybe we'll be able to put slides up there too we'll see i think that could also be useful okay. but um thank I'm you all for coming and dr rothbart thank you thank you uh, my yeah. pleasure and if anyone oh one thing that is another thing that's helpful is talking to other people about your research and i'm including faculty which we don't do that enough i i although i have to say i occasionally bother Sus this person susan allen what do you think of this and what do you think of that is that going to work and, and and likewise i'm doing the same with you dan no i really think the talking with each other really is valuable it, it is so so helpful and we're so fortunate to be in a, a caring uh, school. Um, so it's a pleasure. Um, hope to see all of you somewhere, someplace, preferably in person. That's great. Thanks, y'all. Happy Monday. <laughs>